There be worse the expectation more of worse torments me than the feeling can. I would be at the worst. Worst is my port, my harbor, my ultimate repose. The end I would attain, my final good. My error was my error and my crime, my crime. He taking responsibility for his decision. Whatever for itself condemned, and will alike be punished, whether thou reign or reign not, though to that gentle brow, willingly I could fly and hope thy reign from that placid aspect and meek regard, rather than aggravate my evil state, would stand between me and thy father's ire, whose ire I dread more than the fire of hell, a shelter and a kind of shading cool, interposition as a summer's cloud. It is a fascinating idea. He says, you know, when I look at your face, he says to Christ, when I look at your face, your face is so calm and soothing. Maybe you'll be able to kind of work things out between me and the old man. What do you say? It's an interesting irony, right? If then, he's, he, he continues, uh, if I then to the worst can be uh, haste, why move thy feet so slow to what is best? In other words, why are you taking your time and not getting on with the project? Happiest thou to thyself and all the world that thou who worthiest art shouldst be their king. Perhaps thou lingerest in deep thoughts detained of the enterprise so hazardous and high. Let's pause for a moment and put it in our notes. There's, a, there's two readings of this entire Paradise Regained, which is one of the reasons I love it so much. One is that you, you, you literally have Christ having this conversation with Satan or the devil. But there's a second reading that says, when we have self-doubt, when we are having that internal dialogue of, what shall I do, what shall I do, what's the best way for me to go? It's interesting that there's a certain kind of temptation that's in place there, right? Knowing what I should do versus what I want to do, maybe, is a, is a way to think about it. Perhaps, he says, thou lingerest in deep thoughts the taint of the enterprise so hazardous and high. Maybe you're worried. That's why you're not acting. No wonder, for though in thee be united, what a perfection can in man be found or human nature can receive. Consider, thy life hath been yet private, most part spent at home. Scarce viewed the Galilean towns, and once a year Jerusalem few days short sojourn. And what thence couldst thou observe? Milton wonders if maybe Christ has had a bit of this own self-doubt about, I'm, I'm from a small town in the middle of nowhere. Can I do it? Am I up to the challenge? Can I do the great thing that I've been called to do? The world thou hast not seen, much less her glory, empires, monarchs, and their radiant courts, best school of best experience, quickest in sight, in all things that to greatest action lead. The wisest, unexperienced, will be ever timorous and loath with novice Modesty, as he who, seeking asses, found a kingdom irresolutely unhardy, adventurous, and I will bring thee where thou soon shall quit these rudiments and see before thine eyes the monarchies of the earth, their pomp and state, sufficient introduction to inform thee of thyself, so apt in regal arts and regal mysteries, that thou mayest know, again, back to this knowledge thing, how best their opposition to withstand. Line 250. It's a fascinating speech. Satan will say to Christ, it's time, boy, let's get going. And let me help you get going by taking you to a mountain, line 251. Is this the top of Nephates that we saw, of course, in, uh, in Paradise Lost? There we go to see the world. And from 250 to 309, we have more of that Mom Milton showing off again thing. The Milton catalog. It is amazing. I wish I could read it. I don't have time. But it's an amazing epic of all of the amazing history that's there. Milton, again, demonstrating his prodigious knowledge. At line 310, Christ will see all of the different things. He looked and saw what numbers, numberless, the city gates outpoured, light armed troops in coats of mail, and military pride at line 343 or so, 345, the chivalry word is mentioned. In other words, here we have warfare, soldiers getting ready. At line 347, uh, Satan will speak. Um, that thou mayest know, I seek not to engage thy virtue, and not every way secure on no slight grounds thy safety. Hear and mark to what end I have brought thee hither and shown all this fair sight. Thy kingdom, though foretold by prophet and by angel, unless thou endeavor, as thy father David did, thou never shalt obtain. In other words, it's time to go to work, is what he's saying, right? 
And then he says something interesting in line 364. Um, Take my advice, by my advice is nearer of late. In other words, hey, I need to advise you on how it's time for you to go to work and to, uh, and to fight, right? Not the irony again. Uh, Satan lost his battle and now he's going to give advice to Christ. Um, Take your, uh, and, and he'll say it, you need to take over your enemies and you need to save the Jews. Even at line 374, save the ten lost tribes, if you will, right, of 2 Kings 17, 6. Um, and finally at line 385, this is a grand view, a grand vision of a Jewish nation that will be led by a great and mighty warrior. Christ's response at 386 is fascinating. He says, much ostentation, Vain of fleshy arm and fragile arms, much instrument of war, long in preparing, soon to nothing brought before mine eyes. Thou hast said, and in my ear vented much policy and projects deep of enemies, of aids, battles, and leagues, plausible to the world, to me worth naught. Means I must use, thou sayest, prediction else will unpredict and fail me of the throne. My time, I told thee, and that time for thee were best farthest off, is not yet come. When that comes, think not thou to find me slack. We think of the word slack as it relates, for example, to uh, Adam in Paradise Lost. I think Milton is playing a powerful game here, right? On my part, on endeavoring, or to need thy politic maxims or that cumbersome luggage of war. It's a wonderful line. Luggage of war there shown me. Argument of human weakness rather than of strength. Uh, and then we finish with at line, uh, uh, starting at line 415. It's sad, but we're going to have some Jew bashing here by Milton. No question, as a Christian, he's going to say ultimately that the Jews got what they deserved in terms of being uh, uh, subjugated, especially by virtue of their worshiping idols at 431. No, let them, the Jewish people, serve their enemies who serve idols with God. Um, and, and the final then words at 441 and following, so spake Israel's true king and to the fiend made answer met that made void all his wiles. In other words, none of the temptations were. So final line, take a look at it. So fares it when with truth falsehood contends. When you have the meeting between truth and falsehood, truth will always win. It's significant that the last word of book three is contends, fighting. Why? Because the entire book has been about the struggle, the fight. Let's jump to level 2A and themes messages really quickly. Of course, the power of self-doubt and the questions that one asks oneself about, am I ready? Am I good enough? Am I prepared? Blah, blah, blah. Why is it so hard to overcome those self-doubts? I think here we're, we're kind of witnessing this for Milton himself through uh, book three. How about this question of pacifism? Do we need war? Machiavelli's prince said, absolutely. Would Christianity exist without war, for example? Ask of any religion, would it exist without war, without fighting? And is there a difference for you between war and struggle? Right? By the way, this question, what does happen when truth and falsehood contend or collide or fight? Is it always the case that truth wins? Or is it rather the case that oftentimes Falsehood, in fact, wins. It's an interesting question. What about 2B in rhetoric? Notice our epic catalogs, right? Going, taking us back to the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid. The, the, it shows the scope of the poet. And, of course, it gives us a sense of the universality of the, of the poem, right? Uh, of course, we have the rhetoric of uh, the rhetorical idea of the contest, right? Milton's own rhetorical strength as well. Right? For example, questions are being asked here, like, does England need war? Does God need war? Does Christianity or the religion of Christianity need war? And, of course, the question, does God need me? This idea of the contest, the struggle. Finally, of course, the dialogue format comes to mind. We've pointed this out before. The Platonist dialogue comes to mind. Satan, arg by the way, Satan's arguments are strong here. God, it's a scene really does want glory, how do you explain that? Of course, the question really is, does Christ really defeat Satan's arguments? Many have, and many have pointed out that Milton is playing a very dangerous game here because some of, these, some of these answers by Christ are kind of dubious. Relation to other texts, well, of course, note the irony. 
Satan will lose his battle in Paradise Lost, and then he wants to counsel Christ on how to fight battles. There's some irony there. What are for you the great texts about war? We think of some that we've studied together, Catch-22, All Quiet on the Western Front. Of course, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid seem to celebrate in some ways this notion of conflict, martial conflict. We think of Red Badge of Courage as a way to respond for, um, for Stephen Crane to uh, especially the Iliad, right? The idea that glory, the glory of fighting. What are your favorite texts about war? What's your favorite movies about war? How about this one? What's your favorite video games? And can I ask this question without insult? Why is it that so many of the most popular games celebrate war? What does it seem to say about our human need to uh, engage in conflict of a kind. Finally, at 3B, let's relate the third book of Paradise Regained to ourselves. Question, are Christ's arguments convincing to you? For example, why does God need glory in worship? Right? And if you choose not to worship God, right, and you're thrown out of heaven for it, think of Satan. Is that fair? If... For example, you have free will to choose not to obey, then is it fair that when you use your free will, that you're jacked for it? God wants worship that is freely chosen. So, that is to say, without reward and without the threat of punishment, heaven, hell, right? We go back to, of course, Plato's question of the myth of Gyges. I called it in my lectures the myth of Maverick. In other words, why should you behave, why should you act justly, properly, if there's no promise of a reward and there's no threat of hell? We quoted those lines in that lecture from Gita too. You have the right to work, but for the work's sake only, you have no right to the fruits of your labor. Desire for the fruits must never be your motive in working. Never give way to laziness either. This is an interesting question. It's one I want you to grapple with. What is it that is going on with this question about glory and fame and Milton? Is it important for you to be famous? Is it important for you to be known? In our school, for example, is it important for you to be known? And if so, why? Why do we cut out those state champion uh, uh, pictures and put them in our trophy cases of individuals? Like, what is that about? We are, of course, to the Anglo-Saxon code conversations, aren't we, of, uh, of Beowulf in our lectures there, right? Okay, let's turn now to book four. That will be the last book of Paradise Regained. And let's see how Milton is going to finish this linguistic fight, right? And, uh, of course, that's really what's going on here, this back and forth between uh, um, Christ and Satan. Thank you very much. I'll see you in a bit.